Has someone been honored above you at a dinner party or in salutation or in being called to, in to give advice? Now, if these matters are good, you ought to be happy that he got them. But if evil, be not distressed because you did not get them. And bear in mind that if you do not act the same way that others do, with a view to getting things which are not under our control, you cannot be considered worthy to receive an equal share with others. Why, how is it possible for a person who does not haunt some man's door to have equal shares with the man who does? For the man who does not do escort duty, with the man who does. For the man who does not praise, with the man who does. You will be unjust, therefore, and insatiable, if, while refusing to pay the price for which such things are bought, you want to obtain them for nothing. Well, what is the price for heads of lettuce? An obol, perhaps. If then somebody gives up his obol and gets his heads of lettuce, while you do not give your obol and do not get them, do not imagine that you are worse off than the man who gets his lettuce. For as he has his heads of lettuce, so you have your obol, which you have not given away. Now it is the same way also in life. You have not been invited to somebody's dinner party. Of course not, for you didn't give the host the price at which he sells his dinner. He sells it for praise. He sells it for personal attention. Give him the price then for which it is sold, if it is to your interest. But if you wish both not to give up the one and yet to get the other, you are insatiable and a simpleton. Have you then nothing in place of the dinner? Indeed, you have. You have not had to praise the man you did not want to praise. You have not had to put up with the insolence of his doorkeepers. This long chapter, number 25, gives us some really valuable advice for situations that we encounter quite often. And before we look at the specific examples that Epictetus has, let's talk about the general idea, which is that somebody has been preferred to us or, or honored more than us in some things. So it could be the examples that he gives. It could be all sorts of other things, you know, uh, in the internet world. It could be you write a great blog article, but then you see somebody else's blog article being, you know, posted everywhere, going viral, and you're like, wait a second, what about my stuff over here? Why does that person's stuff get, you know, talked about so much, but mine doesn't? Or, you know, we could think about uh, friends, and, you know, the friend invites this person, but doesn't invite this person. And Epictetus gives us some really useful advice. The three examples that he has here that he starts with are being invited to a dinner party, being invited to eat with somebody, right? Um, salutation is how it's translated, uh, pros agoreuse, uh, meaning, you know, how we greet each other, uh, how we engage with each other, we might say, right? Do you, do you stop on the street and chat with somebody, or you say, hey, nice day, and then move on, right? And then here's one that, that really tends to rankle with us being called in to give advice, literally being brought in, you know, para, uh, leifthenai es sumbulian. Uh, the, the, the term para leifthenai is sort of like grabbing onto somebody and bringing them in the room and saying, hey, we want to talk to you, right? Uh, they do that to your friend or colleague, but they don't do that to you. And then you feel bad and you're like, wait a second, what am I? Don't I rate? And so he says, here's how we can look at it. There's a few points to keep in mind. Here's the first point. If these matters are good, then you ought to be happy that the other person got it. You have a choice. If, if these things really are good, if it's good to have other people acknowledge you and say, hey, I, wanna, I want your advice, if it's good to have people want to hang out with you and chat with you, if it's good to get invited to, to the dinner party or to have uh, drinks after work or, or whatever, to have tea with somebody, to have coffee, then you don't have to feel bad that you didn't get it. You can feel good for the other person who got it because it's a good thing. Not all good things have to come to you. And he says, um, if they're bad, then don't be distressed that you didn't get them, right? Um, they're not actually bad from a Stoic perspective, but you know, maybe, maybe you, you start getting some sour grapes and you're like, I didn't want those anyway. What a drag, what a waste of my time. Well, if that's the case, then you don't, you don't have to feel bad about it, right? They got it, you didn't get it. 
And then he goes on and he says, um, bear in mind, here's the most important thing, if you don't act the same way that other people do, with a view to getting things which are not under our control, things that are under the control of other people, their choices, their thoughts, their judgments, their feelings, their desires and aversions. If you don't do that, then you cannot be considered worthy to receive an equal share with others. This is great advice that applies to everybody from children to, you know, angsty adolescents to 20 somethings to people in their, their, you know, late stages of their career or life. If you don't pay the price, then you don't get what the other person who pays the price does, is what Epictetus is saying. And it's not up to you to decide what counts as the price. It's up to the market out there of other people's affections and judgments and opinions. And it might be a totally irrational market, in which case maybe you don't want to enter that market, right? So he goes on and he says... Um, how is it possible for, this is with a dinner party, how is it possible for a person who does not haunt some other man's door, who's not showing up all the time and chit-chatting and hanging around, right, who does, uh, uh, to, to, um, to have equal shares with the man who does? Look, if you're, if you're not going to hang around and you're not going to make contacts and you're not going to engage in the, the you know, small talk, then don't expect to have the same reward that the people who do. And you might say, hey, but that's unfair. People should recognize my value, and I shouldn't have to do all the chit-chat. Well, that's kind of funny to say, isn't it? We'll see why in just a minute, but hold on to that thought. He goes on and he talks about doing escort duty. If you're not going to hang out with people, right? If you're not going to go to the, the places that they want to go to, then how can you expect to have the same share as the person who does? You say, well, my time is more valuable. I, I need it for reading or I need it for you know, practicing my craft. They should recognize that. Again, with the, with the shoulds, right? You're expecting the world to conform to your own desires. And then he says, um, the man who does not praise with the man who does. Now, praise here could be praising what uh, really is the case. It could be reasonable, rational praise. Hey, this person is, is uh, you know, benefiting the company or, uh, you know, straightening things out in, in our moral environment or whatever. But a lot of times praise is what we call puffery, right? Praise is what we call kissing butt. Praise is choosing to look at the good things and to engage in amplification about them and to ignore the bad parts, right? Um, so if you're not going to do that sort of thing, how can you expect the same share with somebody else who does? And he, again, the retort here is usually, yeah, but there should be a reward for honesty. Well, why do you think that's the case? Do you have control over other people's emotions and desires and the whole economy of how these things fit in with each other. You're the one to decide how culture should work. Isn't that a little bit strange? So Epictetus says, if you expect these sorts of things, if you expect to get better treatment without having to pay the price, you're actually screwing up. He says, you will be unjust, therefore, and insatiable. You're not just making an error in judgment. You are unjust. You are unfair. You're, 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 people don't like it, and they respond negatively to you if you do this, and they are doing something that's perfectly rational because you are being unfair and insatiable. If while refusing to pay the price for which such things are bought, you want to obtain them for nothing, for free, you want, or, or with some other coin. It's sort of like walking into a bookstore and saying, I want to buy this book. And not only are you, you know, one, one thing that people don't like is you pay in pennies, right? Okay, that's already kind of a pain for the people who have to work behind the counter because they have to count all these pennies and there's a line behind them. But imagine you come in and you say, I want to buy this book. And they say, all right, that's going to be, it's a lobe edition, uh, 20 something 99, right? And you say, well, I don't have any money to pay you with, but I will give you a poem or I will give you some advice. 
or uh, I'll wash some dishes for you, or pick whatever else you like. Can I do a little dance for you, a little performance art? And they'll say, get the hell out of here. That's not how we sell things. Well, it's, it's the same way with all of the other things that we want to purchase. If we want the thing, you pay the price. And if you don't want to pay the price, then you, you've got a problem. So he goes on and he says, think about lettuce. What is the, the price for heads of lettuce? An oval, perhaps. That's a little tiny coin, right? Well, if somebody gives up his oval and gets his heads of lettuce, you don't give up your oval and do not get them. Do you imagine you're worse off than the person who gets his lettuce? No. There's a trade-off. You either keep your little coin or you get your heads of lettuce. You can't eat your coin, but you can buy other things with the coin if you want to, right? Or you can even look at it if you get some satisfaction out of that. Or you can eat your lettuce, and you better eat it soon because lettuce tends to spoil. So he says, um, you're not worse off than him. He has his heads of lettuce. You have your oval, which you've not given away. Epictetus goes on and says it's the same way in life. You've not been invited to somebody's dinner party? Well, of course not. You didn't pay the price. You didn't give the host the price at which he sells his dinner. You didn't get invited out for drinks with your, your co-workers or colleagues. Well, maybe it's the fact that you don't hang around and chit-chat with them and express some interest in their, their lives. And you say, well, their lives are boring and mundane or I'm shy or something like that. It doesn't matter. If you didn't pay the price, you're not going out for drinks or whatever else you want to talk about. You know, this is a, a common issue. There's a lot of people who feel a sense of entitlement that they're, you know, they're giving us something by just sharing their company with us, and we should be happy to have that. Epictetus says, no, no, no. You, you have to pay the price. You want to ask somebody out on a date? Well, you better actually smile at them. You'd better actually seem like somebody that they might want to go out with, even if you ne aren't necessarily that, right? And they'll figure it out if, if you're not, uh, because you have to continue paying prices. If you show up to the dinner party and you paid the price of praise originally, and then you turn off the spigot, your host is going to say, I'm not inviting him back. Um, so he goes on and he says, look, he sells it for praise. He sells it for personal attention. Give him the price for which it's sold if it's in your interest. If you want to go to the dinner party, if that's really what matters to you, then go ahead and, and you know, kiss a little butt because that's what it takes to get invited. If, if, you know, let's say another thing, if having a client requires that you email them three times because they, they are a little bit absent-minded or they've got a lot going on and you want to have that client, well, you got to email them three times. And if that really is too much of a, a burden for you, then don't have the client and don't complain about it because you're the one who gets to choose. It's up to you whether or not you are going to pay the price. So he says, um, if you wish both not to give up the, the one and yet to get, get the other, not to pay the price and to get the thing, you're insatiable in a simpleton. Do you have nothing in place of a dinner? Sure you do. You have not had to praise the man you did not want to praise. If, if that's really what matters to you, not having to tell people, you know, things about themselves that aren't strictly true, if honesty matters to you, uh, well, then don't praise people. And then, you know, you're not going to get invited to the, the dinner party. So he says, you have not had to put up with the insolence of his doorkeepers. There's also sort of a little kicker thrown in there. There's always like annoyances that come along with even getting the stuff that you want. You got a schmooze, so you get in the box seat thing for the game, you know, and you watch the baseball game or you go to the Greyhound track or whatever it el else it is. And there's, you know, all sorts of buffet uh, items out there for you to eat and free drinks. And yet the people that you're there with are going to talk all sorts of BS that you you have to listen to and you're like, eh, I don't really care for this. Um, you know, somebody is going to be off in the corner, you know, uh, smoking or doing something else that maybe you don't like, or maybe you wish that you could smoke, right? And <laughs> you can't smoke there. We go on and on and on. Every one of these things involves paying prices and deciding whether we want to pay these prices, whether we want to trade it off for something else. It's perfectly reasonable to think ahead of time, what are the prices that I have to pay? And to realize that you can't have it all, you have to decide where your resources are going to go. What the will of nature is may be learned from a consideration of the points in which we do not differ from one another. 
For example, when some other person's slave boy breaks his drinking cup, you are instantly ready to say, that's one of the things which happen. Rest assured, then, that when your own drinking cup gets broken, you ought to behave in the same way that you do when the other man's cup is broken. Apply now the same principle to the matters of greater importance. Some other person's child or wife has died. No one but would say, such is the fate of man. Yet when a man's own child dies, immediately the cry is, Alas, woe is me. But we ought to remember how we feel when we hear of the same misfortune befalling others. Here in chapter 26, Epictetus is introducing one of these sorts of considerations that reverses perspective. He says, you know, put yourself in another person's place and then look at your own conduct, look at your own decisions, and things might appear to you a little bit different because you do the same thing when you are looking at somebody else's choices, decisions, attitudes. So he goes on and he says, what is the will of nature is, or what, what the, the you know, intention, the bulema of nature is, may be learned by considering the points in which we do not differ from each other, the way in which we are really the same. So we get a lot of perspective by looking at other people as being like us and then applying that to ourselves. So he says, for example, when some other person's servant breaks the drinking cup, you're instantly ready to say, oh, well, that's one of the things that happens, right? So when you go to somebody else's place and, um, you know, you look at their yard and their yard is all messed up, you say, oh, well, you know, it's a drought, uh, not, not that big of a deal. They may be all broken up over it. We do this also, speaking of breakups, with relationships, right? Uh, somebody, you know, has, has a big breakup, maybe a marriage breaks up, or they've been going out with somebody for a while, or it's their more, more re most recent infatuation, and they are just inconsolate. They're like, oh, this is terrible. I'm never going to meet somebody like that. What am I going to do? And they're down in the dumps, and we come along and say, they're there. There's other fish in the sea. And we, we, we have all these catchphrases, right? Why do we say that sort of thing? How come we don't sit down next to them and go, oh my God, it is so bad. Oh, it's so, so horrible. You're never going to find anybody. Unless we're sadists, in which case we might do that, right? We don't do that because we don't feel that way. We think, oh, they're blowing it out of proportion. They're, they're not having a, a clear sense about what the situation really holds. It's better off for them that, that this person is leaving them behind. So... He says, rest assured, when your own drinking cup gets broken, you ought to behave in the same way that you do when the other person's cup gets broken. So when you go through a bad breakup, you ought to behave in the same way in accordance with the advice that you've been giving your friends or your family members when they're the one who got dumped. We don't do that, but we could. That is something that lies within, within the scope of our possibilities. We could choose to do things that way. If we wanted to be consistent, if we wanted to be rational, that is indeed what we would do. So he says, apply now the same principle to the matters of greater importance. It's very difficult to think of uh, things that are more traumatic. There are many things that are very traumatic in a person's life. But the loss of a child is, is one that's certainly far up there. Suppose another person's child or wife has died. No one would, no one, one but would say, such is the fate of man. You know, we say, well, these are the things that happen, right? Um, yet when a person's own child dies, immediately the cry is, alas, woe is me. And he says, but we ought to remember how we feel when we hear of the same misfortune befalling others. If we think that they can manage, if we're ready to provide a kind of sense of perspective, the world is not ended, um, it, it hurts a lot, but you're going to be able to go on, we can give that same advice to ourselves when we encounter similar situations. Loss, poverty, death, um, you know, disease, all the things that we, we find ourselves fearing, social disgrace, breakup of a relationship, uh, the loss of a job, uh, all these sorts of matters, we ought to try, according to Epictetus, applying the same advice, uh, inculcating the same perspective 
uh, the same way of looking at things as we do for other people. We ought to bring that to bear upon ourselves. And if we can do that, not only are we being rational, we're also going to find that it helps us deal with those situations. Just as a mark is not set up in order to be missed, so neither does the nature of evil arise in the universe. Chapter 27 is a very short, pithy statement, exactly the sort of things that the Stoics called a dogma, something that you could sort of memorize and have ready at hand when you uh, encounter difficult situations. This one has thrown a lot of people for a loop. It, you know, it runs just as a mark is not set up in order to be missed. You know, so a uh, target, you are shooting uh, arrows at a target. It's not set up in order for us to miss it. Neither does the nature of evil arise in the universe. Um, you know, ou, uh, the, the Greek is uh, hutos uda kaku fusis, uh, that's the nature of evil, uh, and kosmogenitai, right? It doesn't arise, it doesn't uh, develop. Now, what does this really mean? There's not a, a lot to say about this. This is something we can use to console ourselves, to say, Things are not set up in such a way as to make them necessarily go bad. The universe is not there, you know, looking for an opportunity to, you know, kick you in the teeth when you're down. That's not the way things are actually set up. In fact, for the most part, things go along pretty well, don't they? Uh, you know, you can always find something to, to be upset about or complain about if your desires are large and have to do with outside things. But for the most part, we have a lot of things in our control. We, we can decide how we want to approach matters. Uh, we can decide whether we want to work on our personality, on the structure of our desires and aversions, choices, uh, rejections, viewpoints on things. All of that is within our control. And so it's actually a pretty good place to be, this universe. Things are not set up just to screw with us it is not some sort of plot the way the paranoid person thinks to, to persecute them. In fact, we are being offered this, this uh, golden opportunity to take what we have and work upon it and to, in fact, be happy. So that's, there's a lot more to be said about this because this has drawn a, a lot of commentary uh, down the ages in part because of the somewhat enigmatic framing of the sentence, but I think that's a good way to interpret it as you're going through this, this work as a whole. If someone handed over your body to any person who met you, you would be vexed. But that you hand over your mind to any person that comes along, so that if he reviles you, it is disturbed and troubled, are you not ashamed of that? Here in chapter 28, Epictetus is making a very valuable comparison that can allow us to put things into perspective. And he, he talks about somebody handing over our body to any person who met us. If, you know, if it has to do with our physical space and it has to do not just with our body, but also our possessions or say online presence or other external matters, we're ready to go on the attack when we feel like our rights have been violated, that somebody has betrayed us, that somebody has violated uh, an agreement, anything along those lines. So if, if somebody were to do the extra step of turning us over to somebody else's power, we would be understandably and justifiably upset about that. Now, why don't we feel that way, as Epictetus points out, when it's our mind? Or in, in Greek, literally, it's uh, tain gnomain, um, not the entire mind, but you might think of this as our faculty of deciding, of judging, of thinking things through. Why aren't we so upset when somebody hands this over? Or rather, there's nobody else handing it over. It's ourselves who hand that over to somebody else. And we might do this out of inattention. We might do this because of bad mental habits. We might do this because we're swayed by various emotions and desires and aversions. Uh, we have certain prejudices. We think ourselves totally free of prejudices, which is often in many 
uh, person's cases, a uh, deep-seated prejudice itself. All these are, are things that can prep us for not realizing that we are handing over our mental faculties to somebody else, putting them in somebody else's power. And we do that because we ourselves have power over that. We can make the decision to hand over our faculty of deciding. And so he says um, that you hand over your mind to any person that comes along. Doesn't that bother you? Aren't you ashamed of that? And what does he mean by that? Uh, notice the example. So that if this person reviles you, if this person says bad things to you, if this person, you know, scowls at you or talks to you in an unpleasant tone or is impatient with you or uh, doesn't want to see you today, right, is brushing you off, you can get the sense. Why are you so upset? Uh, we become disturbed and troubled, he says. We don't have to do that. We have control over that if we decide to take that control. That's a big if right there. If we don't do that, then we're in effect giving everybody else willy-nilly our own mind to do with whatever they, they want. And many other people out there in the world would say, I don't want your mind, you know, do whatever you're going to do. But there are many other people out there who are on the lookout for that. Uh, con artists, um, advertisers. Advertising as a whole works by getting us to buy into it. Um, people who want us to vote a certain way, who want our assent to certain things, or want us to reject certain things. On the internet, those who want us to click on the clickbait and then share it because we're upset or because we think it's cute or all, all sorts of other things as well. So Epictetus is saying, you know, if, if the reasoning uh, works for your body, you don't want other people to hand your body over to somebody else, then the reasoning works just as well for your mind, except that it's you that's doing the handing over. Mm -hmm.